Um, hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our event, Exposing the Barriers in Architecture. We are Fame Collective, female architects of minority ethnic. Fame Collective is a research-based network founded to support women of diverse backgrounds of ethnicity and ethnicity in architecture and the built environment. Research published by the Public Health England revealed that the COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic has disproportionately affected the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities and highlighted the urgency for collaboration towards positive societal changes. The recent global protest for the Black Lives Matter movement inspired collective actions and seen an increase in grassroots groups to rise up against racial injustice and various social and health inequalities which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Fame Collective is a network that was started during the pandemic. Our aim is to raise awareness of the barriers, inequality, and the lack of diversity in architecture, and to demand change that responds to our collective challenges. This event is part of a research project and a series of events that will take place, which will be documented and shared with those in power to work towards a change and address the inequality that exists in architecture. My name is Tumpa Husna Yasmin Fellows. I am one of the co-founders of FAME. I'm a practicing architect and a senior lecturer at the School of Architecture and Cities at the University of Westminster. After acquiring over 10 years of experience working for various London-based award-winning architecture practices, I've co-founded the interdisciplinary practice called Our Building Design in, 19, in, in 2018. Our architectural services place people and community at the heart of our projects. I have also co-founded a charity called Mandan Foundation Trust in 2012, a charity actively involved in engaging with disadvantaged communities through architecture, education, and healthcare to erase inequality. I'm a PhD candidate undertaking a practice-based research which focuses on community participatory methods on architectural responses to the changing climate, landscape and social practices. I'm one of the panelists for the Southwark Council's design review panel. My research has been recognized with a commendation by the RIBA President's Award for Research in 2019. I, I have also received the RIBA J Rising Star Award in 2017. Now I'd like to introduce you to our uh, other co-founder, Tahin Khan. Tahin Khan is a British Bangladeshi part two architectural assistant at Architecture Doing Place and one of the co-founders of the group Muslim Women in Architecture. Over the years, Tahin has worked with several architects on projects ranging from private residential to healthcare to preliminary design for a town hall. Currently, she's working on a several social housing projects for local authorities in London. These include uh, interesting typologies such as the feasibility study for a traveler site in Bow to the redevelopment of a formal school site in Broad Water Farm in collaboration with Karakasavik Savik Carson Architects. Tahina and I started having several conversations about how we have been affected by racial and gender inequality in architecture. Since then, we have engaged in many conversations with a large number of female architects of minority ethnic background about experiences of unfair treatment in architecture. Through these conversations we, with many like ourselves, we realize that there are systemic issues that hold us back whether it's in education or in practice of architecture. This, this led us to co-found FAME to create a network for female architects or minority ethnic, and we're open to collaborate with all, regardless of their skin color or gender, and welcome to share our experiences of discrimination. We invite you to join FAME and get in touch with us if you would like to work with us and to see how we can provide support. We're delighted to have Architecture Foundation host this event and would like to thank Rosie Gibbs Stevenson for her support in organizing this event. We'd like to express our solidarity with Muslim women in architecture for their support. 
And we're, we're so pleased to introduce and welcome a new forum called Asian Architects Association. This is a forum that promotes, examines and debates the work of Asian architects. Now I turn to our speakers. We're honored to have Sumita Singha as the keynote speaker who will be joined at a panel discussion with our distinguished four panelists, Annette Fisher, Anna Liu, Hilary Satchel and Femi Orisania. Thank you to all those attending this event and we invite you to join the participatory session for the second half of this event to have a direct discussion in smaller groups with, the, with our speakers where we welcome you to share your experiences of racial and gender inequality in architecture. First, I'd like to invite you, uh, sorry, first I'd like to invite and introduce our keynote speaker, Sumita Singer, for her presentation. Sumita is an award-winning architect with her own practice, Ecologic. Sumita received UIA, UNESCO International Design Awards, Women in Business and Architects Journal, Atkins Inspire Awards, she set up Architects for Change, the Equality Forum at the RIBA, and is a past chair of the Women in Architecture. She's a non-executive director of Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Sumita is a trustee of the Architects Benevolent Society and the Com Commonwealth Association for Architects. She is the founding director of Charushila, an international design charity for communities. Sumita has taught architecture in the UK and abroad. She's the author of several books and a popular speaker on radio and podcasts. Sumita, thank you, over to you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to speak tonight for the inaugural um, event for FAME. I'm very honored by this. And this evening, I'll be talking about barriers in architecture. So the first thing is about the difficulties of race. So um, 2020 has been an year in which we have discussed race uh, predominantly because of Black Lives Matter. And this is actually quite good. But I just wanted to highlight the case that there is no scientific basis to race. It's just a social construct. But in one single sweep, uh, the election of Kamala Devi Harris as the first ever female vice president of the US has shown us that the intersectionality of ethnicity and gender. Um, and it shouldn't actually matter where you come from. Is you know, the, the, the society provides these barriers for us. So the photos on the left, I will show you her parents one who is Indian, the other one who is Jamaican. And she grew up in the States and that's her as a baby with her mom who became a single mom looking after her two daughters. And uh, then you see these other people. One is uh, Norma Sklarek who's always uh, inspired me. And then you have another lady at the bottom who identifies uh, with the native Australians. And then on the left, oh, sorry, on the right, these two uh, babies or children that you see are my children. And looking at them, you can't tell, you know, if they're Indian or where they come from. So our world is very diverse and we embrace different skin colors, different I know, eye colors, hair and everything else. And so that is the difficulty about assigning race to people. So it is the social convenience to put people in categories. Uh, racism exists, there's no doubt about it, despite having, as I said, no scientific basis, because it en enables some people to stay in power. And um, it's one of the biggest barriers in architecture. As Toni Morrison has said, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work it keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dress that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms, so you dress that up. None of this is necessary. There'll always be one more thing. So you spend your life trying to explain yourself and why you're trying to do something. 
So in this slide, um, I have shown the barriers to social class as well. So these two men might seem very different people to you because one is white and the other one is black, but they actually share a very common story. Both wanted to study architecture and both got rejected because they came from a poor background. Um, and it, they were told that architecture wasn't a profession for them. So Wayne, who's at the top of the screen, I don't know if you've seen him, he works for Southwark Council uh, in pest control. And he jokes that, you know, he, he couldn't become an architect, so he became the next best thing, he became a rat catcher. And the, John at the bottom, he's my colleague at Moorefields, he also wanted to become an architect. And he was told that wasn't a career for people of his background. And so he became a pharmacist. So um, the cost of studying architecture is one thing. It's a barrier to a lot of poor people. The structure of architecture, which is part one, part two, and part three, which requires you to have employment in between is another barrier. And then you have the curriculum, which is not inclusive at all and needs changing and decolonizing. And finally, you have your identity, which is sort of social construct given to you, which tells you you can't study architecture. So if you look at the other barriers, um, some of them are hidden for a long time until somebody raises them. So um, please take a moment to study this table and, and think for yourself, what is common here? So you have, um, you know, if you look at the people who are entering part one, and then if you look at part one at the first, uh, second line, and then you look at the people passing part three, and you will see that the architectural representation is sort of skewed towards being white. And, um, the attrition rate, um, you know, there's, there's this common myth oh, if you're Asian, your, your parents want you to become an accountant or engineer or doctor. But actually, if you look at the number of Asian students wanting to become architects, and then you go to, you know, how few actually finish their part three, which is almost half of the black um, uh, students, you begin to wonder what's going on here? What, what, why are they dropping out? And you, you see in that bottom thing, all the different minority ethnic architects are dropping out, including the others, um, except the white ones who have increased their proportionality. And so um, here we have, did anybody notice this? This is the statistics from 2018. I can't find the latest one, but nobody has um, raised this, this point before. So if you look at representation amongst the RIBA, this is the situation at the moment. So I have to say this is a very crude estimate because uh, there were different figures and I had to um, put those together. So the UK population is generally about 80% white. So this is, these are statistics from 2011. So they will have changed now you would have seen um, pro probably an increase in Asian, Black, and other minority ethnic backgrounds. So, but this is 2012 that we're looking at. And then we look at the RIBA members who are, and this is again from um, just the latest survey. And we find that actually the RIBA members are overwhelmingly white. And the council is also overwhelmingly white. And again, you see a poor representation of Asian um, students, uh, Asian people in the council. Um, and it's great that we have um, a lot more black representation, which is great. And the RIBA is doing well for that, but we need to also think about other groups which are not represented fairly. So um, welcome to 2021. This is what um, the leadership of 2021 looks like. And um, one was elected obviously by RIBA members and the other two were selected. I'm sure all these people are lovely. I've met them all and I've talked to them and they bring great leadership skills, but they also represent uh, barriers to uh, the profession or to the organization because visibility is one of the key things you can't be what you can't see. So if you're seeing people at the top who look different to you, 
and nobody at the top who represents you, then you don't want to be there. So it doesn't matter what century we're in. These are, uh, Tumpa had asked me to give some uh, personal examples. So if you look, look here, you'll see that some of these uh, reasons have been given for things I couldn't do. So with a name like mine, I didn't have a work permit in the UK. This was told to me in 92. I wouldn't be able to find somewhere to stay in the UK. This was told to me in 2001. With a face like yours, you look too young to be part of a validation panel. 2003, you're too old to stand for the RIBA precedent. This is 2020. And then with an accent like yours, we can't let you chair events, and then you won't have the gravitas. So all these sort of things are real things that have happened to me. Um, and these are all lived experiences that I'm sure a lot of you are facing. So one of the things, um, what, what is happening is that we are now getting these kind of, we're not getting a very overt form of racism or discrimination. So you get reasons like this. Um, you know, you get things like we've decided to move forward with other applicants who fit our needs better, or it was a long and robust process and sorry, you didn't get through. These are the things we're being told. And we've been told that due process has been followed and it's all very transparent. But, you know, they say, oh, we're open and transparent. But when you go through the door, it is closed. It is closed for you. So what is happening now? Let me show you an example. So this, uh, it was a poll of uh, more than 1,000 most powerful leaders in the UK in 2017. So out of which, if you look at the proportional representation of black and minority ethnic uh, people, you would have expected 136 people in that list at least. Um, or say, okay, let's go half, let's have 68. But no, we had 36 non-white men and only seven non-white women who were in uh, positions of leadership. And then if you look at um, the NHS, which is held up to be a great bastion of equality, you have two non-white female chairs in the NHS and zero non-white women chairs in the construction industry. Although there have been women presidents in other uh, parts like the R RTPI and other places. So, if you want to have a chair of the RIBA who is coming from a diverse background, what do you say? You'd say this, you need significant experience as a non-executive chair. So immediately you're ruling out any person who is non-white, any person that's a woman, you're ruling them out. So this was the recent advert. I suggest, if this is on, 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 on the web, I suggest you go to and see how many of those things you take there. So this is a hidden barrier. This is not visible, but the moment you start to actually understand this, it becomes a barrier. And then there are other hidden barriers. So this is a, a very strange thing that happens uh, within construction. Um, you, you get prizes for being under 40. I don't know why it happens in architecture. So uh, this is um, an advert for building design and construction, which is a US-based organization for 40 under 40. And it's rather ironic that they have a woman in that advert. And it says, can I nominate myself? And if you're under 40, nominees must be under 40 on August 31st, 2020 to be eligible. So that means if your birthday is um, you know, before that or something, you're, you're not eligible, you've missed the board. So, um, and then you have the Architects Journal, which has also 40 under 40. But if you look at the statistics, and these are slightly old statistics, again, uh, taken from the RIBA's um, report, this is 80% uh, um, are male architects and 20% are female. So how many women do you think are, uh, would be under 40 and have had um, you know, great experiences of running their practice? Not many. You know, and but this also hides other things. So women who might have spent a significant amount of time having children looking after them, because that's what you do if you're under 40. Um, they're also you could be you could be a carer, 
you could be uh, disabled, you could be from non-white backgrounds who frequently have problems in progression. So why do we have these prizes which are based on um, age? Um, and then this, as I said, the image is um, a great irony as well. So what can we do to remove the barriers? So the first thing is education. We need to have uh, education. The curriculum needs to be decolonized. We need to actually know what, is the, what are the issues in order to tackle them. And um, secondly, we need to have empathy. So I've heard this from people, even from uh, minority ethnic backgrounds who are saying, oh, well, I've never experienced racism, so it doesn't exist. Please, you know, there are people around who have experienced racism, please have some empathy for them. And thirdly, empower people who haven't got the power. So pull them up. If you have reached a position where you can empower people, please pull up, please don't pull out the ladder. Please don't uh, say we can't do anything to help you. It's your problem. Please empower those people. Don't have adverts and don't have conditions which, uh, which actually are barriers to progression. Consider these solutions, which is having, as I said, you know, having an inclusive and factual curriculum. Respect and celebrate differences because that's what brings out creativity. Stretch the boundaries, you know, I'll show you an example of how stretching the boundaries has been done in procurement. Improve progression, you know, make sure that if you're saying you're employing people from non-white backgrounds, they're not the HR manager or secretaries or admin assistants. Make sure they're in your board, you know, that your board is, represents the place you work in. And challenge, you know, when you come across um, these kind of discrimination, please challenge whether, it doesn't matter what background you come from, please challenge. Um, so this is one good practice that I've seen um, today, actually this morning, where they're trying to improve procurement processes for um, uh, companies, architectural companies that are uh, have, get, having barriers because they are from minority ethnic backgrounds. And this, I'll leave you to, to kind of read this, but I think they're, they're on the right path, but we need to have more buy-in from RIBA, from other organizations, to support us architects to removing these barriers. So I'll leave that on and I'll say thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samita, for sharing your presentation and your ins inspirational um, uh, slideshow. Uh, and one thing that really um, touched, touched my heart uh, was what you said about uh, empowering others. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing and I think and also the fact that we should all challenge discrimination regardless of you know who we are, what background we're from, if we see discrimination we should all uh, challenge it. Um, we will uh, talk about these issues that you have um, included in your presentation later on when we join the panel uh, of speakers. So um, we will now introduce uh, each of the speakers. Yes, so um, we're delighted to have Annette Fisher as one of our speakers. Annette is a practicing international British Nigerian architect. She founded her practice FA Global in 1994, which operates in London and Lagos. She is a former RABA vice president, nominated presidential candidate 2002 and council member. Annette was the first black woman to be elected to RABA council in 1999. She is also the Commonwealth Association of Architects trustee and alternate regal VP Europe and partner of FA Global. Annette is also a part-time part um, part three tutor at the University of Westminster London um, she has won the CAA Award for 50 year anniversary, Barclays Men and Women of Merit Award, NatWest Award for African Professional of the Year, Judge Malta Architecture of Spatial Planning Awards and the Judge Civic Trust Awards. Annette, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, and thank you um, to uh, the organizers for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, just to discuss exposing the barriers in architecture. Now it's something um, that I have to say really made, had to, made me have to think back to my, uh, my own personal experiences. And um, I thought that the way I would um, share um, some insight with you is, is perhaps to share my own story um, as it were. Uh, and how I came to practice architecture. Um, as you've been told, I was, um, I'm of Nigerian origin. I was born here, but I was raised in Nigeria. Um, and I first uh, got involved, got just to uh, know what architects do by doing a, um, being an apprentice in an architect's office and just serving coffee. Um, and that was my first exposure um, at an architect's office in, in Nigeria. And then I um, came to university in the UK. Um, and I think I should say, first of all, that um, studying in England, um, when I was studying, there was um, perhaps 40 in the year, and there would be about four um, that were women. Um, and I would say that right through my, uh, my education, my architectural education, I was the only black person uh, in, through the entire course. Um, and I also, uh, if I recall, there were perhaps four women who started. And I think at the end, there were perhaps, there were two that finished, but it weren't the same two that started. Um, I think I was the only one that went all the way through. Um, and I think that during um, my study, uh, I would say that uh, there, was, there weren't any female um, lecturers. All our lecturers were white male, as was the predominantly in the course. Um, and um, I think these days it's a bit it's a bit better and it's a bit different now um, that you do find women who are teaching, um, including myself, being a part time professional tutor at Westminster. Uh, but in at that time, you know, holding your own um, within in those circumstances, when I look back, was something that um, I suppose you 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 just took on board, but in reality. Um, um, you would find that you would you there was always this pressure to be to be better than any to be better than everybody else because um, you felt that if you weren't that you wouldn't um, you know you wouldn't get the marks and you wouldn't um, move forward um, through the courses. Um, but uh, I did get through, and um, I, I remember when I started, I wasn't. Um, I thought, you know, seven years is a long time. And so I decided I would just take a year at a time and see how I go. But I did finish and I did do it straight through. I didn't take anything more than the year out, which I did the first year out, which I did in my native Nigeria. And then I, um, uh, when I finished, I came down to London. I studied in, in, in Glasgow, by the way, University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Now, when I came down to London, now the, job, now the challenge was to get a job. And um, obviously I have a, an English name, uh, although these days um, I do have an African name. Um, I've always been known as Annette, but I do have an African name. And now I, I actually use all of my names so that there is no, um, so that I am identified as African. But at that time I would, you know, in the, in, that was, this is back now in not too, aging myself now, but this is back in um, 1989. Um, start looking for a job. I remember my father saying to me, oh, you know, you know, he, he had some contacts and he'd help me get a job. And I said, oh, no, 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 I want to apply myself and send out letters. And I thought I was quite confident that I would get a job. But I think like probably about two or 300 letters later, I still didn't have a job. Um, and so I had to go back to my dad and I said, well, you know, I'm not getting anywhere with this, you know, can you help? So, um, I would say that that was, and, and what would happen, I should, I should just re retrace that. I would get interviews actually, 
um, I would get responses. And then of course I'd show up for the interview. And of course there's two things. One, I, um, if I'd spoken, I'd, I would have spoken to someone on the phone before I went for that interview. And um, when they spoke to me, I mean, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't know uh, what uh, race I was at that point because I didn't have an accent as such. But on more than one occasion, I'd show up for the interview and I would see the people, the shock on their faces would be like, oh, she's black, excuse me, you know? And as soon as that happened, you know, you kind of knew straight away, well, you know, I'm not gonna get this job because you could see from their faces that I wasn't, I didn't look like what an architect ought to look like, right? So, um, but I mean, I wasn't deterred by that. Um, and eventually, as I said, my father got me uh, a job uh, with quite a big um, uh, architect London practice. Um, and, um, you know, and I, and I started working there. Uh, that practice was um, T.P. Bennett. And I, again, when I joined that practice, um, it was quite a big practice. At that time, I think they probably had 100 staff. Um, and I think there was maybe one female associate in the practice. I think, if I recall, I was the only Black person in the practice. And I think that there was maybe, if I remember, perhaps two other women <laughs> working in the practice. Um, and, you know, it's a funny thing. You think that, well, you know, that shouldn't matter. And to some extent it didn't because I took it on board, but, you know, it's quite a big challenge. You always think to yourself, if it was in reverse, you wonder how um, the, you know, in other words, it was predominantly a black practice with only two couple of white people in there, um, how those, you know, candidates would, um, would be able to cope. Am I doing for time? So, um, I and again in that situation because of my um, uh, perhaps because of the way I was introduced to the practice, I did get quite a bit of exposure and, and experience on projects. Um, however, I wasn't paid very well, and I remember asking for more pay. Um, after about two years of being, you know, and, you know, they said, oh, no, they couldn't pay me any more money. So I started looking for another job. And when I did, and I found another job, because one of the, about the things about um, getting into architecture is once you have got, had got some, got some experience under your belt, you can um, move. Um, and when I did move for another job and, you know, say I was, I was going to leave, it was only at that point that they then said, you know, well, actually I had moved and one of the partners contacted me to see if I would come back um, and wouldn't. And then when I um, offered uh, and he made me an offer, which wasn't what I wanted. And so I moved on to the other practice. Um, but I think let me just try and move a bit more quickly because um, time is short. Um, I then um, I worked in London for about six years and then I, I also had a, a short period in America. Um, that was another experience um, with regard to um, race. And um, I mean, there it was a bit different because, you know, if you had having an English accent in America was kind of made you a bit different. And they found that quite curious being black with an English accent. Um, but in, in, in the UK, I ran my first big project when I was 26 um, in central London. Um, and um, you know, I, I, again, I remember going to site for the first time and the, um, the contractors and various people didn't know where to, you know, first of all, they didn't expect you to be the architect um, and they didn't know whether to wolf whistle or to say ma'am or whatever. But um, again, in that, in that situation, um, what I have found in my career is that when you, you know, I had a, was quite focused and sort of doing a good job and getting it done and gaining the confidence of the clients and very so on. And so after a period you do, you can overcome some of these isms. Um, uh, I should say that um, I then um, had a period in Nigeria and, I, um, and then I came back from the States. I set up in practice with one of the partners of, a, of, of one of the practices I'd worked for before. 
Um, and I think having a white partner is always a, is always a useful thing in, in, in setting up in practice. Um, and we won, we won a number of projects. But I think the I think one of the other barriers I would have said is is you know people taking you very seriously. Um, the other thing is I think that as architects we're not trained to be business people. I think that's another aspect that is really important um, that we don't get enough of. Um, and I I really got involved in the RIBA when I first got the um, was learned that you you know you really needed to be a good marketer to get good business. And so I joined the Women in Architecture group. And when I joined, um, they, um, they asked myself and two other, two other women to stand. I mean, really we had 24 hours notice. And I stood, uh, well, I, we had to put in a little, you know, write your, your what you call it, your, um, what your um, uh, ideals were and why you thought you should run and all that sort of thing. Um, and I got through. Um, and I, you know, in retrospect, I remember at the time, when I, I mean, I just did it and I, and I got in um, to, onto council. And I remember at the time there was a big article in the newspaper and it was called White Towers. Um, and that article said, well, maybe there was a change. And you have to remember this was back in 2000, 1999. And at that time they said, the article said um, that maybe the RIB was about to change because for the first time, uh, you know, a black woman has been elected to council. And, you know, as you know, I was very young at that point in time and I didn't, and I didn't realize, you know, you don't know, you know, how big this was for, for Britain. I mean, for me, I had just done this and gotten in, but they thought, wow. And, um, and it was not long after that, that I did become, you know, on the council, I was quite vocal which again, they didn't expect. And I would say that a lot of what has carried me through in, 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 in the profession is um, a level of confidence. And this is one of the things that I think is a real barrier um, in the profession. Sumita um, raised in her presentation, the, um, the uptake of um, students going through from part one to part three. And I'd like to sort of finish just you know, talking about just touching on that, because um, that graph, that those that table that Sumita um, put in there, has been plotted as a graph, and when you plot that um, that that table as a graph with students on one side and the timeline on the bottom, where you have part one, part two, and ARB, what you see is um, the intake of um, white students, which is higher up on the graph rising up as you get towards um, part ARB and, and, and uh, uh, qualification. And then for Chinese, Black, Asian, everybody else starts lower down the graph. And as you get to ARB, it uh, diminishes to zero. And when we had a discussion at the university about that, what I did say to them, I said, you know, there's a very simple, some people said it's very complicated. For me, I think it's very simple. That graph represents, um, and that white, that line of the white students, you know, rising, is a level of confidence. When um, a white man is in architecture and practicing, he can see as he gets closer to the end, as he gets closer to 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 being qualified, he can see his future. He can see the partnerships, the big practices. It's all waiting there for him, you know. On the other hand, as we, as whether it's a woman or Asian or Chinese, as we get closer to qualification, we, and we get, we become, we identify what is there, the opportunities seem narrower, closer, more closed. And so the level of confidence as to where, where what you can do and how you can aspire to reach the pinnacle of, a, of the, your career is very limited. And so my, my, what my view about um, the barriers and what we can do about them is key is, is confidence and the role models, the necessary role models that we need to have out there so that um, P and events like this and Let's Build, which we set up so that our people who look like us um, believe that there is a seat at the table when they finish. And I'll end it there. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, that was a very thought-provoking uh, talk that you've given us, and we'll, um, uh, we'll talk about those in detail in the breakout room. Um, so now we're going to move on to the next um, 
uh, panel speaker. Um, if I could um, kindly ask all the panel speaker to keep their talks for approximately five minutes, please, because we want to have detailed conversations in the breakout um, room with the audience. Um, so our next panel um, speaker is Hilary Satchel from Part W. Um, I'm delighted to introduce her. Um, Hilary Satchel is an architect and urban designer with over 20 years experience in large scale placemaking, state and urban regeneration, planning and design quality. She's a director of Tibolts. Hilary is part of the action group Part W who are working across architecture and design campaigning for gender parity and greater diversity um, more generally across the built environment, including a high profile campaign around the RIBA Royal Gold Medal. Hilary is a design advocate for the Mayor of London as part of this um, role, is involved in diversity issues within the built environment and the Good Growth by Design Supporting Diversity Handbook. Um, related procurement issues and the role of social infrastructure. Hilary is on a number of design review panels and is a trustee of Design Southeast. We are particularly interested in the work of Part W's campaign and Part W is a women's action group that launched a protest at men only RIBA role gold medal. Over to you, um, Hilary, thank you. Thank you. That's brilliant. Can everybody hear me? All right. Is that OK. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. OK. So I am going to talk about the part W work because I think that's really interesting from a barriers point of view and understanding how some of the structural barriers that exist can sometimes be more or less hidden and um, actually aren't things that you can resolve by any individual action. They're things that take societal change over time and a lot of pressure from different people. But I thought I really liked the question that this that this event was about. And I thought it was worth just reflecting on some of my personal experience very quickly around some of the, the most challenging barriers that I've had to deal with. And I think they've often been about what leadership is, what what leadership means and how you move into a position of having it and responding well to that responsibility and what the things are that sit around you that either stop you doing that directly or indirectly um, as um, Annette um, talked about, and Sumita talked about, or indirectly make you feel that you shouldn't be doing it or, or actually that you're not right because you haven't done another thing or another thing yet to get there. And I think the, 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 the situation I think that really, that really makes me think about this is that early on in my career, quite a long time ago, I worked for bosses, leaders in architecture um, that really didn't believe you could have any kind of management role or may even manage a project as a senior role if you worked part-time, i.e. particularly if you had children um, or you dared to not be in the office sort of, you know, however many hours for however many, for, for the full week. So whilst they wouldn't say they were sexist or discriminating people, their views on what it takes to manage a project or even a practice meant that they were being sexist and discriminatory. They were basically saying, you can't ever be in a role like me because you don't look like me, you don't behave like me. Um, they were all men. Maybe this is a surprise to some, maybe it's not a surprise. Um, and only one of my colleagues, someone who I still work with today, did manage to combine working part-time and being an associate director of the practice, but she'd really had to fight to get there. And at the time, I think the directors kind of thought they'd let her in as an associate director, but they didn't really think that she was one. But the sort of the judgments and the, and the way people um, decide who is okay in certain roles and who is not can be really can be really difficult to work with. So they've made a decision to, to reflect and support only one form of leadership based on the times you were, were willing to be in the office and which excluded people with both with childcare responsibilities but other responsibilities they have. And that could have been men or women. And increasingly, I think over the past 20 years, things have changed a bit um, in, in that. But this is an example um, of people who are choosing practice leadership in their own image and their own set of values and leadership roles. Um, and I found this particularly challenging. I don't particularly support a lot of their values. Um, I found the lack of openness to collaboration with others really difficult. Um, a means of feedback that was often based on shouting. I really did not support that. 
um, but it was the way that the practice worked. Your feedback was delivered in a meeting, in a huge meeting room at a massive table by being shouted at by someone. This was really not a very healthy way of working. Um, an approach to um, retreating into leadership huddles whenever there was a small crisis. I found this kind of, are you in the group or are you out of the group? Well, I, I, it's, so, it's so difficult to deal with. Um, and so a group of us in the practice decided it didn't have to be like this. We just, we got to the point where we, we really, we, we, we hated certain things that happened with such a vengeance that we just had to make change. We had got to the point where change had became necessary. Um, and so we decided to leave and we were going to set up on our own, but doing similar work. So about a third of the business was the sort of work that we did. And we wanted to sort of set up on our own to do it. Um, and we'd largely been running the team that had done that between us by then. Um, and this ended up being a management buyout, a part of the business, which um, we were negotiating while I was, six, I was six months pregnant, involving lawyers writing expensive contracts, working out how to run a business, register for VAT, chupy staff, and, and continue to run pro projects. It was a really steep learning curve and, and a massive challenge, but we did it. And that um, the thing that we did and that we set up is, is the practice that I still help run today. Um, Tibbles Planning and Urban Design and for 15 years it was run by an all-female board. We didn't make a big thing of it, we didn't really want to, we didn't think we should make a big thing of it, but actually I think, you know, we did a really great thing, we, you know, we did this thing without, without necessarily thinking um, that anyone was telling us we could, we just, we just decided we had to get on and did it, we had to do it, we had no choice. We've managed some really large projects, significant multidisciplinary teams, really push on design quality and design led planning and half of the directors have always worked part time and not all of us have children. So I've worked part time for three days or four days for 10 years and I was perfectly able to lead and run a practice, the practice the world did not fall apart. Um, and I really think I have to try and in my life now support people who don't want to fit the mould of or aren't able to fit the mould of working part time. And I do spend quite a bit of my time now trying to protect the time of people who choose to work and who are only employed to work a certain number of days. I think that's important. So I've had to learn from that process and then do something about it in how I then support others. Off my personal journey and my reflections on that now, onto the kind of part W um, bit of this, this, this sort of talk. And I think it's really interesting to reflect some of the much bigger scale barriers um, that we have to deal with in architecture. Um, and so this really came through the work that the part W group have been doing around, the, around awards and who wins awards and why do those people win awards and particularly the Royal Gold Medal. I can't quite remember precisely how this came about, but someone realized that out of 100, and I think it was 172 years of awards, only one woman had ever won the Royal Gold Medal in her own right, and that was Zaha Hadid in 2016. There'd been three partnership winners that included women, so Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey in 2015, Patty and Michael Hopkins in 1994, and Ray and Charles Eames in 1979, and then 172 men since, since 1848. And when you put it like that, you think, hmm, okay, there's something not quite right there. Um, how can it possibly be that, that, that this group can split quite so evenly down on, on gender grounds? Um, and this, the campaign around this really started the day that the Royal Gold Medal was going to be announced in 2018. And I think it was only a couple of days before that we thought, right, we need to do something about this. So we asked people to, to take a picture of themselves with an alternative nomination for who should have won the Royal Gold Medal in any one year that, that wasn't one of the people that, that win it, primarily women, but not necessarily. How would an alternative gold medal list, list look? And we had a brilliant response of people from all sorts of backgrounds in architecture. Um, lots, of, lots of people would write who they wanted to nominate, post it on a picture and post it on Twitter. And actually it was brilliant. People were really interested in thinking differently about who could have won. This didn't necessarily mean that the people that won shouldn't have won. We're not taking away their award. We're saying there's a different way of looking at this. There's a different way of reflecting who could have been on that list. Um, I've had a number of people say to me, oh, but are you saying they weren't good enough, the person that won? No, no, what we're just saying is actually they could have been a very different list. This could look very different. You don't have to think that it was only possible for a man to win for 172 years. You, there, there are, you know, there is, there are different things happening here, and there are very clearly some barriers. So, how do we think about what those barriers are? 
So we really came across and started investigating these barriers when we looked at the nominations process for the gold medal later in 2019. And how does this nominations process work? It was shrouded in mystery. It was really hard to find out. But during a very short period, I think about six weeks, on the RIBA website, a miraculous page opens where you can nominate and it gives you this form and you can fill it all in. And how open is transparent is this process? Because between the opening of this window and this website, you can't nominate. And only RIBA chartered members um, or other members of the RIBA can nominate. So, that, so there's various things that are hidden about it. But the nominations process is fascinating. They want the sort of statements you would imagine about why this person should win the gold medal, why they're worthy or what they've achieved. So far, I understand why you need those statements. But there were some hilarious things written in the form that, that you just have to think, OK, right, so this is only going to benefit certain people. They want supporting evidence. I get that. So an example given is, can you tell us where the architectural monograph might be about this person? Ah, OK, so do certain people only get architectural monographs written about them? Sounds like they do, um, because actually none of the people we wanted to nominate had an architectural monograph. So we had to find published articles about them. Certain types of published articles clearly carried more weight, mainstream publications. But who's writing about, I, I chose to nominate Kate McIntosh. Who was writing about Kate McIntosh when she was designing Dawson's Heights? Absolutely nobody. Um, it just wasn't published in that way at that time. There are There is lots written about it now, and there are articles published in, in the AA journals and actually uh, in the Guardian and various different places. And there are places, but it's just not, it's just not something that there's a massive body of evidence to support. Um, and it, so it's really pushing the idea that the kind of the normalized view of the good and the great is where this award should be drawn from. And I have a particular, I have a particular struggle with that idea. What if your work doesn't sit within a mainstream view of what is excellence? What if you're not seen as fitting the narrow view of what authority looks like? Um, what if someone else, your boss perhaps, claim the credit for your work because working for a large company is only the, the only way you could deliver projects? And there are real examples of that where people who previously won the Royal Gold Medal, they only won it on the back of work that people in their office did pretty much in their own right. These are real challenges and they raise really important questions for me about, about this normalised view of authority that I, I really struggle with and what excellence looked like and who's allowed into this set of judgments about excellence. I find it too narrow, too mainstream and too easy for people to decide that your work or, or your excellence is just not the right type to be recognised in this case. You're just not quite, well, you're not quite there, this other person is better for reasons that tend to also recognise certain groups. So part W have worked our campaigns to let people know that this issue even exists. We've produced diagrams to explain how the Royal Gold Medal process works to make it more transparent, which I think the RIBA found quite useful, and to shine a light on what this lack of transparency does. We've organised and coordinated nominations of women from different backgrounds and areas of excellence to make sure they are just on the table when the awards committee decides who should win even though they don't even have to decide from those nominations and can decide anyone can win as long as they can fit the two criteria which are very broadly alive and excellent. We've built relationships with the RIBA so they don't get quite so terrified now whenever we send an email asking for some organisation, uh, some information I hope, and they're starting to see that some of the real challenges that us and others have been raising really do need addressing. And whilst we can't fully claim the credit for the change in the Royal Gold Medal winners, we do know that the last two years have been a little bit broader than the last 183 or 173 or whatever it is, with Grafton Architects winning in 2019 and David Ajay in 2020. It's also led us to look at things like Wikipedia, where um, quite shockingly, something like 85% of the posts about people are about men and 80% of the, them are moderated by men. And the barriers getting onto Wikipedia are really challenging if you haven't been published in a very standardized way. This is a massive barrier, not just to representation in architecture in the built environment, but as we've been founding out to also to who wins awards, who gets written about, and then who is authority and influence within our industry. So we need to challenge these things. And there are groups doing this. We need to think about who gets published, who gets written about and to try and put pressure on organisations to represent a much wider set of stories, a wider vision authority and a particularly broader view of what excellence means. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very inspirational talk.
Uh, now we're going to move on to the next speaker. Um, Tahin, are you going to introduce Anna? Yeah. Um, Anna Lu is an architect with 18 years professional experience in the UK, um, China, Japan, and the US. She founded the Tonkin, she founded Tonkin Lee with Mike Tonkin in 2002 and leads the studio's public landscape and sculpting projects. Alongside practice, Anna has been a tutor, examiner, juror for leading architecture schools and awards and including the Architecture Association, the University of Westminster and the RIAS Building of the Year. Um, Anna, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Um, I want to start by uh, putting forward a premise that uh, overall the architectural industry is slightly marginalized. Uh, and that's maybe perhaps the, the reason, you know, for me, this idea of barrier is to do with inside versus outside. So if you put the barriers up, you, you are claiming that you know where the the inside is and where the outsiders are. So people who don't belong or people who do. And to begin with, whether you're, you're a man or a woman or, or uh, white or non-white, I think the, the industry is suffering as a whole uh, for, for being marginalized in being able to deliver amazing buildings and, and environments. And also it suffers as a whole from the beginning, uh, early, early stages in, in terms of education, uh, a slight confusion, you know, is it art, is it science? And, and the prospects um, that it won't be very well paid uh, and it will be a sort of unstable uh, industry. So the job prospects are also really poor. So as a result, if you were uh, a margin on the on the margin of, of uh, sort of mainstream uh, you as a woman you are slightly discouraged to pursue something that's uh, so marginal um, so this idea of outside versus inside I want to sort of stick with uh, as, as a concept uh, because I think normally people define architecture as uh, delivery of design and delivery of buildings well, I want to uh, stretch that definition a lot. Uh, for me, I discovered architecture later in life, uh, age 20, um, when I was studying in the States and I was very privileged to be able to sort of make that switch to architecture. Um, but for me, be maybe because of discovering late in life, I, for me, it's a, a way of life, a way of thinking and a way of using my hands, my mind and my heart. So it's a lifelong journey. And that sort of um, maybe has led us, my, my partner and I, to practice uh, in a way that involves both teaching practice and, and as well as research on top of that. But as a result, it takes a lot longer to succeed in this way of operating because you're sort of uh, not only stretching the boundary, uh, the definition of, of what, what an architect does, but also in terms of building up track record, you, um, you got to prove that you have to deliver um, a number of things in, in each uh, sector. And so over the last 20 years, we've delivered projects in architecture, landscape and, and sculpture, uh, which finally after 20 years, we sort of built up a really good track record. Uh, and we've proven ourselves in each of those uh, the fields. We, we even designed a medical, um, medical instrument. Um, so it's interesting to work this way because I think it's much harder, but it's also quite fulfilling. And it takes a lot longer and it, it's, it doesn't give you immediate nor uh, obvious commercial success. And therefore, I think as a whole, as a profession, we have to continue to push the boundary of, of architecture. Uh, and that will make it a lot more inc inclusive uh, a lot more interesting, it will make the profession grow and, and less likely to sort of put up these barriers that are for me quite slightly arbitrary. And as Sumita mentioned, a kind of social construct. And they're there only because somehow uh, there isn't enough um, work to go around perhaps. And there's, there's just, you know, people are doing it out of fear. So if we all work collectively to push the boundary of architecture, 
and also to push the definition of success. You know, Sumita mentioned that Asian families uh, view view sort of the traditional successful person as uh, the doctors or lawyers or accountants, and that that is very true. Um, let's define success as not just uh, stability and and perhaps earning uh, a, a kind of a very very good income, material success, but let's define it as a kind of really fulfilling journey, which is something that I find with architecture that it has continue to inspire me and challenge me and in, in so many different respects. And so it's stretching me as, as much as I'm trying to stretch it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, that was a very inspirational journey that you shared with us. Um, now I'm going to introduce Femi Orisania. I'm delighted to introduce Femi. Femi is an architect um, and principal at HOK's London studio which he joined in 1999. He's a part three part-time tutor at the Bartlett UCL and an RIBA part three external examiner at the University of Cambridge, um, a member of the RIBA validation board and chair of RIBA Architects for Change expert advisory group, which seeks to improve equality, diversity and inclusion in the education and practice of architecture. Femi was recently elected as a RIBA London Council member. Femi also has a strong voice within the role of, uh, of the civic architecture that civic architecture plays in unifying people. Over to you, Femi, thank you. Thank you very much, Tunda. Um, you're probably wondering why, why am I on this uh, panel today? You know, um, the man in, in the room. Well, it's quite simple, actually. It's because I am an ally of all those who are underrepresented in my profession. You know, in order to become an exemplar profession, we need to have everyone um, from all walks of life, from all areas of, of society. Now, I am a minority, but women are a minority within a minority, and women of ethnic minorities are a minority within a minority within a minority, okay? And that, makes it really difficult to that's the that's really the first barrier i mean you know the reason why i'm part of architects for change and you know as sumita said earlier on she was um, one of the founding members and i think was the first chair 20 years ago now 20 years hence how far have we moved i'm afraid to say i don't think we've moved that far you know we still have the same issues so whether it's racism, sexism, all the isms, these are the barriers that are stopping this profession from really flying. Now, start off at 10. In the last year or two, there's been a lot of noise. Um, you know, uh, when I became chair, I said I would only take on chair if things were happening. And I'm, I am pleased it is moving slowly, but we are moving, I would like to think, in the right direction. You know, Alan Vance, the CEO of the RIBA, came out um, a few months after the Black Lives Matter and put their hands up and said, we're not doing very well, okay? We need to do better. That's great, that's gone on record. Um, for those of you who follow it on the RIBA website, you can see it. So what have they done? Um, you know, the first thing they did, they brought on um, an EDI consultant um, to try and strategize and work with existing members of the RIBA staff. And by the way, I do not work for the RIBA. I am a practicing architect like many of you on the call today, but I'm, I'm involved and in giving up my time to try and push this forward. So yes, the EDI consultant is coming and putting fo forward the strategy. I said two years ago that they needed to have an EDI director, someone at the very high level to be able to advise and effect change. You know, I understand that, um, you know, they're in the process of trying to hire someone. So that's taken two years, okay? Um, but at least they're making a, a, a fist of trying to make it happen. And then the inclusion charter that was pushed out, um, I think just last month. Now, it's all moving in the right direction, but slowly. Um, the group that I chair, the Architects for Change, in a way that covers all of the, uh, I won't say all of the areas of underrepresentation, but it covers some of them. 
you know, um, some of you will have known about them, but you know, the seven key work streams that the RIBA and the AFC are trying to move on are social mobility, gender parity, black, Asian, minority ethnic representation, okay? I, some people may say that is the non-whites, um, but you know, we, they are underrepresented and we do need to look at that. And then there is obviously the LGBT communities, not forgetting disability, Again, mental health and well-being, that's progressed quite a long. And then religion and belief. Now, if you are a female architect from a minority ethnicity, you intersectionalize across those seven, maybe two or three, okay? So with each one of those, you'll find it more difficult to actually try and make a play to be recognized within the profession with doing something that you love. Because let's face it, you know, many of us do not become architects to become rich. You know, it's our vocation, we're drawn to it. But if you're drawn to it, you want to be able to get the, the benefits. I'm gonna just, you know, maybe talk about a, a small story of, of mine, okay? Um, we talked about networking. I've heard the, the, the inability to find work. You know, everyone needs to have a, a bit of a super strength. Um, my super strength, believe it or not, wasn't my ability to be a creative designer. It was actually because I could play rugby um, and I was pretty good at it and so much so that actually my first job came from a game of playing rugby one day um, at the fairly um, recognizable rugby club. So being able to network outside of one's comfort zone, being able to present oneself is going to be is really important at trying to find work and you know if you are a member of the ethnic minority you've got to you, you know, you've got to go out there. Um, it's not easy. I, I, I can't, I don't think that, um, I think it'll be wrong for me to say, oh yeah, all you have to do is network and you'll, you'll find work. You've almost got to find something to connect yourself with a potential employer and a potential architect. And once you can actually get in, then it makes it so much, much easier. So I think I'm, go I'm gonna stop now because I'm conscious of time, but I think what I'm trying to say is that you know, those that are on the call today, it's great to see. I am slightly disappointed that there aren't many more men, actually. Well done to the men who put their, who've actually um, signed up to, um, to, to be part of this debate, because ultimately, it is the man that is going to help try and improve the situation for female architects and also for the minority ethnics. So, you know, more work needs to be done in trying to get these people onto the table. Um, Tumpra, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Femi. Um, um, my, my thanks to all the speakers, and we would like to discuss some of the issues that you have spoken about in uh, more details in the breakout room. Oh, everyone's returning. I think there are people still signing in to this room. Yeah, you cut us off just as we were kind of finishing. I'm not quite sure I've got everyone's name. Apologies Thank for you. that. Uh, so apologies, Christina. It wasn't me. There's there's someone behind that just cut <laughs> it, and I'm, I'm and I'm sorry, Nana, that you didn't get the opportunity to speak or or, or Carl. Uh, apologies for that. We we're a bit pushed for time. Um, so in order to summarize each of the rooms, if I could ask one person from each of the room to summarize what was uh, discussed very shortly in one sentence please can i can i start is that okay yeah, go ahead yeah. samita so one of the most interesting points that came out if you just want one point is that we are always speaking to the converted whether it's the inclusion charter or today's conference we're always we're all the same mind we're all good people but who are the people that need to change those are the people we need to target thank you very much samita um can I invite uh, Annette to rise, please? Uh, two key points. One was um, the, um, a Korean student who said that um, the RIBA structure at the end of part two um, doesn't allow for an ongoing visa to finish part three. So it actually cuts them off, um, international students, and she wants to know about the international rights for, um, for um, students to be able to continue 
uh, their part threes. Um, and the only other thing is that part one, um, a part two student who couldn't hardly get a job of part one and what she could do to do that. And I was suggesting doing some part-time work during her part two or volunteering so that a firm gets to know you. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, can I invite Hilary to summarize, please? Yeah, we had a brilliant small group, so we all got the chance to talk. Um, I think we had a really interesting discussion around our sort of design language and types of design that seem to be acceptable or unacceptable and what it means to be the right kind of architect with the right kind of views and how it feels to be outside of that. Um, and also talking about in sort of architectural language, how you feel like an outsider often at university and that doesn't often go away. And actually, is it do we need to use such complicated particular language or do we just need to introduce it differently? So I think there's some really interesting language barriers um, and also actually thinking about um, how we stop defining design in such a narrow way or good design in such a narrow way. Thank you, Hilary. Um, can I invite Anna to summarise, please? Sure. Uh, and Anjum, would you like to? I think you're on mute, Anjum. Great. Hi. Go ahead, Anjum. Uh, we just had a discussion of um, how um, how long it may take for uh, a young architect who's finished their studies to really feel they have the confidence to um, almost become assertive within their profession and then feel confident enough to challenge and make their mark as an architect or as a part two or part three and just discussing how um, building that um, confidence is important and how long that may or may not take. So we were just looking at that aspect of um, really uh, stepping your mark and um, sort of um, showing that you are credible enough because you have done the architectural studies and you are just as good as anybody else. Um, so it's just about learning or understanding how long it may take within a profession to kind of get to that benchmark where you feel confident enough within your profession to finally be like okay no I know enough and this is a good point for me to just vocalize what I do or do not know. Thank so you. That's what thank, we're you. thank you. Thank you very much Andrew. Um, I think Femi you have uh, nominated Barvina from your group. Yes it's um, I think it's Barina, Barina, Barina BB. Sorry. You're on mute. Hi, sorry, I couldn't unmute for a while. Um, so we had a few people from a few different um, stages in their career talk about what they've experienced. And um, it was really interesting to hear that some bigger practices are taking the first step to include an ED, EDI um, uh, policy and um, there was another um, person who spoke about how um, they faced um, some barriers when they were in um, a practice and they decided to start their own practice afterwards which um, now has a much better um, policy towards diversity and inclusion um, and we also spoke about how university is often the first barrier when it comes to um, diversity and, um, and, and inclusion. Thank you very much. Um, oh gosh, we've run out of time and it has been such an interesting um, event. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I wish I, we could have more time to continue this discussion. Um, so next time, I think we'll reflect on this and um, allocate more time for a more participatory um, session. So um, before we end, uh, I'd like to um, ask any of the, if any of the panelists uh, have final remarks as a way of reflecting on what we've discussed so far. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so we won't be able to take any questions, but I, I'm hoping in your uh, breakout room, you were able to ask questions and directly speak to the speakers. 
So if um, anyone has any final Well, I'll, I'll go, I mean, as I, I think uh, as one of the members in, in my panel, the fact that large practices have started the EDI committee and are starting to address barriers across uh, areas, especially with women, um, trying to progress in the practices is, is fantastic because ultimately men have to try and be advocates and stand up, support, empower, and mentor uh, women to rise through the profession. Thank you, Femi. Um, anyone else would like to say final remarks? Shall I just go? I've really, I really enjoy the, the thing of hearing other people's um, stories and, the, and about how people have addressed things and actually at all different levels. And I think that kind of cross career time, cross experience thing is, is really useful. And I really think that we can all learn a lot from listening. Um, to some of the challenges that each other has and being reminded of those in what we do in our day-to-day -day life because um, we're all on a journey and we've got quite a lot to do and I know some of the things I'm going to go away and think about a little bit harder after today. Thank you Hilary. Um, um, I'd just like to say um, real quick um, that first of all uh, don't underestimate the value of what you bring um, as fame because this is the kind of role model um, representation that is needed for uh, young aspiring architects. Um, you will be inspiring confidence in others. And it, interestingly enough, I've just had a mail from one of my students who, um, professional um, um, Westminster students, who's just sent me a message um, uh, saying how uh, she found this issue of confidence was so uh, really related to her. And this sort of thing does inspire confidence hugely, hugely. Um, and I would just urge you to not only continue with it, but also to link up. One of the things that I think that we all suffer from in this, um, the minority thing is the whole old colonial thing of divide and rule, where we come together regardless of um, race. And may I make one point, um, Femi, women are not a minority, we're more than half um, of the world. So representation should be 50%. Um, so therefore, um, I'm a minority in our profession. Be, I know, me. but we do need to be joined up. We do need to be joined up. And with that, we can do so much more. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annette. Sumita, you wanted to say something? Um, no, they just thank you so much for hosting. This is a very inspiring event, and I'm sure there'll be lots more to come. The problem is that, as I said, you know, we're always speaking to the converted. And what do we need to bring about real change? Who is it? And I'm going to load that onto Femi and, and say, please uh, take back all this stuff back to the RIBA and say, you know, this is not good enough. Signing inclusion charters, when we know that what happens with the architects declare, they do all sorts of things, oh, we've signed a charter, so that's fine then. So, you know, we just need to have real change. I am fed up of waiting. Thank you, Sumita. Anna, did you want to say a final? Yeah, I, th I think just uh, empathy is going to empower you because if you are always empathetic towards other people who are maybe even further outsiders than you are, then that will, um, I think, make you not, not don't want to say more confident, but make you realize that it is a, a long journey and, and um, you are there to help um, and don't judge things on it, you know, it's just appearance. Someone might not look like an outsider, but is actually really sort of struggling with the profession because it is a, a quite a tough one. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, my final remarks would be that I'll t I take away uh, from this, uh, especially what Samita said about considering inclusive challenging discrimination and uh, you know education empathy and empowering others these are only very very you know small uh, things that I, I'll take away but they have so much power in making a change in in, in our profession and uh, and I think we all have power um, to do something and I, I, I totally uh, take on board what you said about we are talking to the converted and we we welcome others to join us um, together our, you know, our voices will be louder um, and stronger. Um, so uh, unless Tahin has anything to add, I'd like to end with a sentence or two. Tahin, did you want to say something? 
I, I just wanted to say that um, we have more events coming up in, in the um, coming year. So this is just the beginning of a series of events and we hope to put together a document or a report um, with everything that we've learned through these um, sessions. So I just wanted to add that. And thank you so much for everyone that attended. Thank you our speakers for your amazing speeches. And yes, I um, yes, I really enjoyed it. So Tampa, I'll pass it back to you. So we feel there is an urgent need to collectively respond. Um, so this is our first response um, from FAME. Um, we hope to grow in providing the much needed support towards female architects and minority ethnic um, to overcome the barriers of racial and gender inequality, both in academia and in practice. We hope to inspire others to come forward and to join us in our discussions about experiences of race, gender inequality in architecture and we invite uh, those who are not affected by um, gender or <laughs> racial discrimination to join us, especially fame and, and you, you know, get in touch with us, who, whatever your background is. We'd like to see how we can provide support and work together. Together we're stronger. Um, so I'd like to end by saying thank you so much to all our speaker for your time, your energy um, and your collective effort to make this such a success and our audience for your participation and for sharing your personal experiences and the Architecture Foundation and Rosie, thank you so much for your support. Thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank you, Tampa. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.